Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, day three. Day three? Yeah, day three. <laughs> Indigenous Fashion Arts Festival. Um, I'm Sage Paul. I'm the Executive and Artistic Director here at Indigenous Fashion Arts. Um, and today we are kicking off the panel series with anti-fashion, resisting the fashion establishment. And basically that's, uh, fashion is everything that's not mainstream essentially. And we're going to get to uh, chat with some incredible panelists. Um, Evan Ducharme, uh, Karina Emmerich, and uh, Sadie Redwing. Um, and the, your moderator today is Raleigh Kutrin. Our panel series is supported by, in presentation with um, TMU, the, the Toronto Metropolitan University, the, the creative school of uh, fashion there, the university, and then also by Shirk. Uh, so thank you to our partners for making this happen. Um, so without further ado, I will invite our guests out. And I'll also mention, since he's on the panel today, my red dress is by Evan Ducharme. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you, day three. <laughs> That like sweet spot of exhaustion and like joy where you're just going and you're, you just need to keep going. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, miigwech uh, to IFA for inviting me to moderate this panel. Uh, my name is Riley Kucherin. Uh, I'm from Bitigong Nishinaabeg. Um, thank you so much to the whole IFA team, Harborfront Center, for putting this panel series together and making us look so good on stage. Got that good light. <laughs> Um, also, uh, many thanks to the Fashion at the Creative School and Shirk, as, as Sage mentioned. I'm very excited for this panel because I think I've said for a while that I have a love-hate relationship with fashion. Um, I love the creativity, I love the beauty, I love what it can do for Indigenous communities in particular. Um, but I also hate the fashion industry. The fashion industry is colonial and capitalist and, and is destroying the planet as we speak. So. Where do we fit in? Do we oppose it? Do we work with it? Are we outside it? Are we inside it? Um, I'm hoping to dive into all of that today. But first, our lovely panelists can introduce themselves and talk about who they're wearing as our first question of the day. So, Karina, <laughs> I'll pass it to you. Okay. Hasahel, Karina Amrkatidstat, Spoiler Pabstrad. Hasahel, Chad, Alta Lena Behoking. Um, I'm Karina Emmerich. I am Puyallup um, on my father's side, and my mom's here today too. So hi, mom. Um, <laughs> Shout um, out. And uh, and I'm wearing e Emmy Studio, which is my clothing line. Um, I this was in the fashion show last night. We showed last night presented. Um, my jewelry is all by land-based designer Tanya Larson, who's a Gwich'in uh, designer, incredible. And my shoes are by Camper, which is like a Spanish sustainable shoe company. <laughs> Thank you, Karina. <laughs> Hello, Tansayanin. My name is Evan Ducharme. I'm from St. Ambrose, Manitoba, Treaty 1 Territory. Uh, I'm Métis, with ancestral ties to the Cree, Ojibwe, and Soto peoples. Um, today I'm wearing vintage gilet on the top, waist down, Evan Ducharme. And <laughs> Reebok, Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> Catherine Hepburn wore a Reebok shoe and she got her Kennedy Center honor and it's been my like mainstay f for a while now. <laughs> so hello everybody, my name is Sadie Redwing. I am a citizen of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation and I'm also Cheyenne River Lakota, so coming here from the South Dakota area. Uh, to be honest, I'm wearing uh, an assortment of thrift, <laughs> maybe from rummage sales too, but looking on the, uh, the tags, I see it's all sheen, um, but definitely revamped by my grandmother who um, had a good uh, uh, sense of uh, fabric design and also uh, bone design. So i um, wearing a little bit of grandma today and a little bit of, of uh, second hand. <laughs> love it, love it. Um, and so perhaps now a bit more about your work and who you are, and I guess I'm curious right off the bat, do you identify as a fashion designer? Are you an artist? Are you an activist? Like, I think we're all kind of grappling with this term, fashion. Mm -hmm. Karina, we can start with you. Well, I guess, um, 
I, I am a fashion designer. I do work in fashion. Um, but I but I more like identify as an artist. I think that because of the way that I create my work, that everything is made to order, custom ordered. Um, and a lot of times when I'm creating, I'll only create one unit. Um, I don't mass produce a lot of things. And so some of the really more special garments that I spend a lot of time doing are not consumable products. So they're not something that people can buy. I just love to share. And which is, you know, not great for me um, financially. <laughs> but it's, I mean, that's part of the conversation too, you know. It's like the fashion industry has made it nearly impossible for people to find success unless you're exploiting labor. Um, so we can talk about that too. But I, I think I more identify as an artist, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm on the other side of that. I always identified as a fashion designer. I always wanted to be a fashion designer. But as I went on in my career, people started referring to me as an artist. And like friends of mine who went to art school and had a proper arts education would come to me and bring me into that circle. And I think that I've just um, be, yeah, not feeling comfortable being called an artist and then being welcomed into that space was really fruitful and generative for me and helped me take myself more into an artistic space and, in, and focus on that side of things instead of being so consumed with building a brand and building an empire, which is something I used to say as a child and then much, got much more. I used to say the exact yeah. same thing. I wanted yeah. to build an empire. Yeah. 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 And, and now I'm like, I just want to pay my rent. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just want my parents to have a nice house to live in when they're, when they're in their golden years. Um, yeah, it, I've, it's been a strange relationship between that fashion designer artist situation. And in the last year, it's kind of been cemented for me. Okay, you, you might be more of an artist than a fashion designer. Yeah. Yeah, so I would say I identify as a design educator. So when I got asked to do the panel, I was like, ooh, like I don't, I'm not <laughs> into any fashion or I don't uh, make uh, any type of materials. So but there's a lot of connection between design and fashion, thinking about uh, resources, products. I, uh, my profession, I would say, outside of teaching, would be more of the graphic design, but a lot of knowledge on, uh, I guess, history. And I think in thinking about the connection between fashion and design, design not meaning uh, graphic design per se, but any aspects of invention. So inventing, making, creating, um, I think there's a lot of uh, shared elements as maybe we can call ourselves inventors in some aspects. So what I find myself is really diving deep into, well, where did all the inventions come from? How did it start? How do we incorporate land to demonstrate sovereignty through adornment? As well as how do we share that? How do we visually communicate that? And I think there's a lot of, again, a lot of relationship between graphic design and fashion and thinking about progression of media. So thinking about uh, where it was like 1800s photographers to uh, magazines to, uh, uh, I guess, television and to internet. So I think it's just really interesting to um, have that alignment. Uh, and thinking about hearing your answer about being an artist. I always try to stay away from, uh, to identify myself as an artist, particularly work-based. So I think if you were to take a class with me, we'd open up and say, okay, do you call yourself an artist or do you call yourself a designer? And as an artist, I feel there's a lot of freedom to express emotion. You have a lot of freedom to do whatever you want. It's beautiful. And think, but as a designer, eh, got, got a little bit of protocol, got to got to really think about what you're doing, what you're inventing, the function, and I'm particularly talking about too graphic design. And uh, you got to know your audience. You can't just be doing anything free. You got to uh, be a little bit more respectful and responsible, and know the intentions of where your uh, your practice or your demonstration is going. So. Um, uh, yeah, so I would, in, in, in a design, in calling myself a designer, I would say more of targeting the audience, uh, particularly with indigenous perspective. Uh, I do like to do art on a free time, but uh, for uh, a professional identity, uh, I'd say more of a designer. Not to right. do any uh, competition between either <laughs> one, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're not, it's not one against the other <laughs> here in this room, but a couple things you, you mentioned. Um, yeah, I think about like even in grant writing, you know, 
there aren't a lot of grants for fashion designers, and I think because there is that linkage to the commercial, whereas mm -hmm. there are more for artists. And so it might be a strategic decision to call yourself a, an artist or a textile artist. Or, um, and then I think maybe some of this, not confusion, but this um, deliberation about what we call ourselves also comes from we'll have our own languages and our own words for things like making or creating or yeah so fashion isn't in our language so we would have other words and like it's up to us to find those words and and find the good from those um so what is indigenous fashion then is what i'm kind of wanted to hone in on first to define the good we'll start with the good we won't like we won't dive into the tea it's still hot it needs to cool a bit but so what is the good what is indigenous fashion and then we'll talk about what is maybe mainstream fashion or, or that dichotomy. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, don't, I think indigenous fashion is so incredibly diverse. Mm -hmm. Like, that's one thing that I really tried to fight, to come back, like when, we, when we're talking in um, fashion magazines and stuff about indigenous fashion, is that we are not a monolith right. and that we are uh, vastly different from all different places and we all have something to share, um, stories to share, and, and we can talk more about trade lines and all that stuff, but I don't know, indigenous fashion, how would you define it? <laughs> uh, we do indigenous fashion. Yeah, <laughs> fashion made by indigenous people. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's the primary, best. but um, uh, I haven't, like, that's, that's a really hard question. People have asked me that before in magazines, of course, and, and interviews and things like that. And it's similar. You need to always make the distinction that everyone is so diverse, we're not a monolith, right. and that we occupy so many different sectors in the mainstream fashion industry. There are people in streetwear, there are people in couture, there are people in avant-garde, and it's like mm -hmm. we run the gamut of where, where, where we're making strides, where we're you know, um, taking up space. Yeah, I um, definitely hard to define indigenous fashion, but I really in the I guess what I admire, what I think is unique about it is we can adorn ourselves with items that come from here. Like that's a, a, a strong advantage that we have in in knowing where uh, particular maybe materials, items, uh, animal products. I think. In, in, in thinking about in, in historical wise, knowing that we adorned ourselves to protect. So the concept of threading, um, you know, think, putting things together to, uh, I guess, either have some type of protection. I'm, I'm talking more about like a breastplate. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from the Great Plains area, I know if you were to kind of categorize an indigenous fashion to a particular place, uh, I know that I would bring in, uh, let's say, the conversation of the evolution of buffalo hide. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about, well, why did we use buffalo hide to adorn ourselves? And I think, I think people like overthink a lot of things, but at the end of the day, like buffalo hide is climate control. Like there's so <laughs> much science to, uh, to our fashion. And I think that, I don't think people grasp that in some aspects. So, um, in, in to, to, to kind of give a definition, I wouldn't necessarily know, but just to know that we were so smart in adorning ourselves particular places. And then also, we had such great pride and honor. And I think one thing that I really wanted to, uh, if I had a chance to um, assemble the pieces together, uh, we have a lot of pride. We like to show ourselves in means of our achievements and our awards, whether that's within a headdress, but I, specifically the image in my mind I think about all the time is I have a grandmother uh, uh, who uh, has a 7th Calvary uh, coat with uh, uh, either a type of symbol that might reflect uh, the death of General Custer and just to wear that, just to know that we're not afraid. So that oh. power, so that concept of power and pride and honor and, um, and there are a lot of fashion uh, practices that show your bounty or whatnot. So I think that's in means of like those aspects are so beautiful and so unique, but I just don't think um, that that's not grasped in mainstream or maybe why we might have particular scallops or, you know, sometimes it might scare a little bit, scare people. I just uh, thinking about, I just watch Apocalypto and uh, mm -hmm. some of the, uh, the tribal men there had, uh, like skulls, like adorned in themselves, but that's just a sense, like, hey, I'm not afraid, mm -hmm. and I and I love that about our our uh, genre of fashion. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, um, it 
indigenous fashion stands in directly in a, a in opposition of the narrative and the story that have just been told about indigenous people in the mainstream fashion industry. It, like throughout French couture and throughout just high fashion in general, indigenous people have been used as an inspiration point with very little um, thought or consultation, any kind of goodwill process among that. And we are now here to reestablish that, again, like we are not all the same. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, like, like you were saying as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fashion was really good at um, at pausing the representation of indigenous peoples, right? Like it stopped <laughs> with with like contact, and then that's all we became, right? And we're kind of like trapped in that traditional representation. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really great point about. Uh, I think even just like plural indigenous fashions is we should probably start using that. I'll be like correcting myself and everything, but it's indigenous fashion arts plural. Um, and I love what you said about the diversity and the place-based, right? And that even to think about the word indigenous, it's like from that place. Mm -hmm. The fashion from this place is indigenous. So that's interesting. But any more kind of, of those broad strokes? Like what do you think about power? We mentioned pride. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's place-based. Anything else that comes to mind, indigenous fashion? I mean, I think like uh, when we we're talking about land-based design, like like my friend Tanya Larson is, uh, you know, she does everything from like the she goes to the caribou hide camps and does everything herself by hand, and then makes these incredible things. So it's this whole story that's behind it, and it's not just like something that's um, disposable. I think so. There's so much value in a lot of it. Um, like I use Pendleton wools, which I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest, um, and I love that I it's still like buying local in a way. And we can talk about more about the Pendleton and uh, Indigenous people connection because it's a very interesting relationship. But um, yeah, I, and also, I mean, just thinking about the fashion industry, I think they just now realized Indigenous people are still here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, like just kind of found out, and and I always think that. Like we were saying, that we're we're often stuck in a historical context, and with when we talk about these conversations regarding appropriation with indigenous people, it's a different conversation because those things were stripped away from us right. and outlawed. And so I'm I come from um, my great grandmother uh, um, uh, Rose Juanita McLeod, who was a boarding school survivor at Cushman Boarding School, and so it was like all of those things were stripped away from us. So then when we see people taking the concepts that were outlawed for us that we were killed for wearing, you know what I mean? And then, and now people are profiting off of the things that they stole from us. So that's something that's really a difficult conversation when it comes to appropriation. Um, and so I think when I use Pendleton Wools, it's almost a reclamation of the things right. that were stolen. So that's, I, yeah. Reminds me of the runway last night with the Hudson's Bay coat. And oh, right, rubbish. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I would even throw the word survival. Um, I had a chance to listen to Karina and Evan really talk about, um, you know, we're, we're going to create with what we got. And sometimes we don't have access to particular resources. I mean, Evan, you were saying that uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a really struggle to get, if you're buying and ordering online and for it to even make it to your destination. And I think, you know, kind of growing up in a rural area, very conservative country, a little bit homesteader in some aspects. Like, I didn't have I'd have to drive three hours to go get school clothes. Mm -hmm. Or if the clothing that I would get would probably come from rummage or hand, you know, uh, hand, handed down from older siblings or relatives. So I think just the matter of uh, we do have that beautiful creative gene in us where um, it's almost to the point where we're so good at revamping, even if it is, uh, you know, not the best quality, but I think we're really... Uh, self-sufficient in thinking about, um, you know, at the end of the day, I do need a shirt on to go into the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just the concept of, like, we, we're going to use these resources to survive. Right. And I think that's just been held and ingrained to us. So going back to how, um, like, we, uh, that, the reclaiming, but then also kind of put it in your face. And I think that's what um, is really nice about bringing those concepts and histories in today where... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can we can uh, hold our our, our uh, heads up high and ex explain and share the story of why Pendleton is. Right. Um, so I'm, uh, yeah, I can see see it in, in that aspect. 
yesterday we were talking about sartorial sovereignty, like the ability to dress yourself, and we lost it. It was stolen from us, mm -hmm. violently ripped from us. And so that's that kind of like awareness and education that you hope people have, but they often don't. But it's like also, I think about that heart knowledge, right? Like you need to know that damage that was caused in order to kind of understand the anger, in order to understand why we might be anti-fashion, why we might throw our middle finger up at the fashion establishment. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to chat about Pendleton? Because we were chatting about it. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about it. I mean, yeah, Pendleton. So they, you know, it was a company that started in blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't know, like, all the history. But they well, were go way back. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like a catching. settler couple that started, uh, uh, you know, woolen mill, and they stole everything, I think, from, like, the Nez Pierce tribe, all the original prints. Um, and, then, but, and then started selling it back to indigenous people. So very much like... Uh, similar to Hudson Bay Company, I guess, their, mm -hmm. you know, path of colonialism and exploitation and all that insane insanity. But there's so much, we were talking about, there's so much tied between colonialism and the fashion industry mm -hmm. right now. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it is really interesting. But when, with Pendleton Wools, um, I do really respect that they are, uh, you know, handmade woolen mill. They're a union-based company, so there's no labor exploitation. It's made um, from local sheep, uh, like sheep herders or whatever, in the in the in Oregon. <laughs> so I'm like stumbling over my words. It's so weird hearing yourself on a microphone. It's like really <laughs> trippy. I'm sorry. It's like, like you feel like Britney Spears. Yeah. You're like got this like weird audio. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, so I love their sustainability practices and I think they go above and beyond. And I also use um, the EcoWise wool that they make, which is a cradle to cradle. And, you know, often uh, we talk a lot about how circularity is not a new concept and that's something that's always been really important in indigenous communities. And, um, you know, we were, we were raised to know the importance of salmon and, and how important that like our entire lives are based on that one thing, you know, and that like, the trees and all the you know nutrients in the soil and everything comes from that. So thinking about circularity is so important with fashion. So I use a cradle to cradle, which means that um, it's it's um, made as a regenerative fiber, and then it goes back in in uh, the soil as a healthy additive instead of being poison. So it's not just a cradle to grave, but it comes back. Um, so yeah, better. Yeah. Those are those are all great things that I support. But it is an interesting conversation. Right. Yeah. And so you, you approve the, the company's practices today, but it's also a comment on histories of that theft and, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I say my work exists at the Center of Aesthetics and Education. Oh. And so I think, like, I really like to tell the stories behind the clothes that I make. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Like you were saying, you know, it, everything has a, its own story. Mm -hmm. Um, we were so yeah. Backstage, we were talking about how colonial fashion is. We had a great conversation backstage. You should have heard it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the colonial fashion fueled colonialism in Canada. It was like the beaver felt hat. Mm -hmm. That was the industry that fueled colonialism. It was this extraction, this you know, scouring the world looking for things to steal and take back and sell and get inspiration from. So you can actually pinpoint the birth of fashion with with colonialism and, and, and then industrialization. Like, it's, it's the worst of the worst, I think, in a lot of times. So how do you, how do you start tiptoeing in it, or how do you navigate it? Do you call yourself anti-fashion? Are you opposed to the fashion industry? I think we can oppose it and also function within it. Right. You know, gratitude and critique can right. live together. Um, but it is quite difficult. You know, like in especially in the last few years, being more brought into the mainstream fashion industry and publications and institutions, it's been incredibly interesting to see. Let's call it the the difference between how we are spoken to behind the scenes, even through just email, and how we are positioned and how we're programmed compared to our contemporaries and the other people involved in these projects. Um, I think I'm alluding to something in particular here, Karina. <laughs> um, yeah. and, it, and, and, and the same breath, it's also not up to us, a marginalized community, to you know, make good off of something that was done to us 
out of our right. that was out of our hands. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, in thinking about uh, anti fashion or uh, it's kind of hard because I think we all uh, we we know what we like. We like stuff. So meaning that individuals uh, like I have. Uh, within entertainment, there's particular things that I like. There's particular items that create nostalgia. Um, there's particular, maybe more mainstream, uh, sub uh, subculture aspects, and that relates to all of my interests. So the music that I listen to, mm-hmm. um, if I'm a sports fan, uh, there, uh, you know, the movies that I grew up on, or whatever it may be. I think um, there is. It's it's really hard to find that balance because. Uh, um, in thinking about, you know, if uh, things that I might be attracted to, like a 90s baby, I love, like, just, um, you know, how uh, MTV really highlighted or just even shared or even think about how much hip-hop culture has influenced. And um, as I'm trying to gather my thoughts and kind of weaving uh, what I'm trying to say together is uh, I, in the means of I don't agree how fashion can be super exploitative, destructive, harmful, um, just that, con- like, I feel like we can really lead the conversation and appropriation if we had greater resources to explain where a particular trade comes from, and that's a whole, uh, you know, you're, we're sitting here, we're indigenous, we have to know that history. It's a little bit exhausting, but then also, too, um, you know, I... Uh, you know, I like, you know, sneakers, or I like uh, maybe like new era caps, or, you know, the, the SoundCloud rapper that I listen to, I might want to dress, you know, dress like them, and um, I think it's just really hard to kind of not pick a side, but I think we're still really learning how to morph that together, and then also preserve history, but then also uh, either if you want to say revamp, or know a direction that we're going, and I think it's just really nice to see... Um, that being expressed visually um, through fashion. So I really admire um, uh, you know, how you guys defend, but then also too, there's probably competition, a market that you, um, and even to how do you get known or recognized or be unique? It's, um, I feel like it can be exhausting <laughs> in many aspects. Yeah. Evan, you mentioned this kind of you know, new attention, the spotlight's on us. Um, it's all come pretty quickly Mm -hmm. as well, right? Four or five years, it's exploded. Um, So what do you make of that speed? What should we be cautious of, or how do we protect ourselves as we have this spotlight on us? Hmm. Literally. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's... It's really interesting. I, um, when I was growing up, I didn't want to be like a native designer. I just wanted to be a fashion designer who happened to be native. And I, and I didn't want to be like, because sometimes it does feel like to- very tokenized, yeah. right? Um, and then, you know, the older that I got, then you really realize uh, the things that are most important to you in your life. Um, and this was one thing that is like so incredibly important for me. I can't separate those parts of me. I'm an artist. I am indigenous. I am, you know, also white. I am all these things. I'm like a whole bunch of different things. All mixed into one, I can't be anybody but who I am. And I think that once you kind of really just sit in your own place where like where you are and, and start understanding who you are, then the expression that comes out of that uh, just becomes so much more authentic, right? This word, <laughs> authentic. Um, but it really is, and, and the best advice that I ever got was stand in a place where nobody can push you off of. And that really is, like, you have to just be who you are. And that's, gonna, that's going to lead you forward. That's going to lead you on your best path. And the collection that I just did was really a conversation about the past couple of years dealing with, um, like, mental health issues because with the pandemic and everything, and, and, and I always say we weren't surviving a pandemic, we're surviving capitalism during a pandemic. And it's been extremely difficult. So um, I think, but so, so much of my healing is through my work. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know what we were talking about. Oh, tokenism. Yes. Yeah. So, so, then, so then it becomes, um, 
you know, I think it's really, it's really interesting. People think that, you know, if we if we're out here trying to exploit our own culture by being indigenous designers, right? But it really is the way that we're portrayed in the media. Mm -hmm. When we just, I'm like, we're only put on lists of seven indigenous designers to watch. Indigenous, uh, we we're only put in magazines if we're dressing an indigenous person. So it's like we're still separated from the fashion industry. Um, we're still put into a box and we're still moved over here. And it, and and I just can't wait to bridge that gap. But like you said, in the past few years, it's there's been so much attention that's been placed on it. And I, sometimes I feel like people are just checking boxes. Right. When you have BIPOC, right, black indigenous people of color, then these companies now are just checking, oh, we need a black designer, we need an indigenous designer. So they're checking these marks to get you know, the, the woke crowd. Their diversity oh, and inclusion yeah. mandate, yeah. Yeah, so that they're not coming after them. And, and so then it's just like, not all the opportunities we get feel good. And I certainly do not take, I would say, 60 to 70% of the opportunities that are given to me. Because I don't need to be on somebody else's platform as like a... As like free ad dollars for them, yeah. really. Yeah, and, it, and they don't pay yeah. it. Nobody pays you right. to do yeah. anything. I hate to use the word clickbait, but like yeah, yeah it is, very it is. much it seven designers. Yeah. It's like a your yeah. woke on. clickbait, <laughs> right? Faux woke clickbait. Faux, oh, faux woke. Yeah. <laughs> what? Um, and so, so yeah, they're not changing their ways, right? Mm. As they invite us in, they're not changing anything about how they do business, anything about how they operate, right? They mm. expect us to mold to their fashion mm. system. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, uh, I heard family and, and going home, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and that's similar to what I heard yesterday from Dusty of Mobilize, is that you just stay true to your values, right? You don't, in the wind, you don't sway too much. Mm -hmm. you, you stay grounded, you know? Um, and that will keep you safe, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I just, I lived in Vancouver, uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Two territories for 11 years. And just last August, I moved back home to my home territories in St. Ambrose. And I hadn't realized how much I had to bend myself to fit into these spaces that were never really welcoming to me in any way. Mm -hmm. I mean, early on in my career, when I was young, people didn't know I was Indigenous and I could move in spaces as white passing and... Um, was, you know, bared witness to insane <laughs> bouts of racism from people in the industry when they thought there was no right. one watching. Right. And that was incredibly harrowing. But as I got older and, you know, went further on in my journey of self-actualizing, the work just becomes so much more um, connected to your being and you, you just can't separate the two of them. And then being back home and realizing all of the things that I've kind of lost or I kind of left behind, like getting to see my nieces and nephews grow up and being around in, for my, my grandparents' golden years and all of these things. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's just kind of given me a fresh perspective and kind of reinvigorated me in a different way to, to move in a different way within the industry. And, kind of smooth out a bit of those bends that I've had to make right, through, right. Along, the, along that path. Right. Yeah, I think one of the fires that keeps the, um, the tokenism going is I feel like people just can't like verbally explain or know how to write, and that's just the challenge and the struggle of being so underrepresented. When you're so underrepresented, there's not enough mouths giving definition mm. to particular things so we're not educating people on how to really uh, you know either you know write a particular description to attract you know particular artists or designers just because there's there's not enough mouths there to explain um, and to give a little bit of a context I working with some of my uh, my uh, graphic design students who want to build publications or magazines and they want to um, highlight confidence, let's say like confidence and maybe a brown woman, well, there's not enough mouths out there. Our students are not hearing from enough mouths on how do you uh, explain the beauty of that. There's just not either enough adjectives, I don't know if English doesn't have enough adjectives, <laughs> but like you don't hear enough explanation of how to critique something, review something. Why do you find that beautiful? And I think we're still at that, uh, you know, the very beginning. And I want to say, like, we have a lot of, lot of way to go, but um, 
I could just, yeah, I just be really curious on, like, um, you know, you say, like, uh, you know, how maybe someone who has no competency of indigenous culture, and then, you know, they're just, they're not communicating with me, and is it because they just don't hear enough people communicating with, you know, indigenous artists and designers? So I, um, yeah, I can only just imagine how you handle situations like that when, mm -hmm. um, now you're the educator. Now you, um, you know, someone, and then, then, then someone might take your words, either flip them or, <laughs> yeah. or, you know, just do it in a way, as you say, going back to, well, that goes into clickbait, you know, like, um, so it's just, where do, how do we break that, that cycle? How do we get more mouths to talk about and be able to give greater adjectives and descriptions on uh, how we're demonstrating beauty or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is we're really, Interesting, like we're talking about the attention that's been paid and the door's open. And it's like, how long will the door be open? And, right. and we're just like grabbing everybody we can and like, come on, let's go, let's yeah. go, let's rush through this door. And then like, what's the staying power? Like, is it, is it just, is indigenous fashion just like trending? Or is it something that people are actually like having respect for? And so I'm just so grateful that we get to be in charge of the narrative now. Right. That's the most important thing. But, and I also feel like that it's so community oriented that we really, uh, I like really try to focus on collaborations as well. Like I don't feel like I'm in competition with you, Evan. No, right. I feel like we're in community together. And I think that we, I learn so much from all other indigenous designers. But often we're, giving, we're given one opportunity to represent indigenous fashion. And, and no, nowadays you cannot just be a designer. You have to be a historian and you have to, like, you have to know like, everything and be the, like, the most educated person on every single thing that you're doing. And it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure. Um, uh, to be like a representative, but at the same time, it's like, well, you're just one person. You can only do your, what you're doing. But, right. Perhaps it's helpful to just, if you start from a place that it's going to end, the window's going to close. Mm -hmm. What are you going to focus on? Mm -hmm. You're going to stay close to your family. You know, you're going to build those relations. You're going to make sure that when, it's en when it ends, when the storm comes or the storm <laughs> leaves, you're, you know, you're good. You're mm -hmm. healthy. You're taking care of you and you're taking care of yours. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to give a shout out to the curriculum work that you're doing? Because you're trying to, you mentioned nations and communicating about nations. Yeah, so I think, um, I think us as uh, either, if we're starting out as Native American students or finding ourselves in a particular profession, uh, I feel like any track that we go on, we just don't have enough training or resources or enough mentors to really uh, help us explain or sit in these, you know, these issues that we're talking about today. And, uh, and one of the reasons why I find myself within design is design is not necessarily visual. Sometimes it's an operating system. It's how you assemble things. And uh, you know, when I talk to my students, I said, one advantage that you have as a, as a, as a demographic or a breed in this whole continent is you know what a tribe is. Don't forget that. You know exactly what a tribe is. So going back to the community, like we're experts. So we should be the ones explaining uh, what that concept of, of a tribe is. So I, in, in noticing how uh, when we come in, if we know how to work within a tribe, then we're natural designers because we know how to assemble uh, stuff. We're really smart about strategic. Strate strategy mm -hmm. is um, one thing that I feel like we're just not highlighted enough on. So in thinking about uh, future artists and designers and what is needed to get them prepared to go out into um, you know, a working uh, world, if you uh, you know, want to be a beater, well, you got to know how to sell, <laughs> you know, you know how to make an income. If you are a wood carver, um, in thinking about uh, other than just selling your product or, or, you know, participating in shows or museums or galleries, uh, you know, you would uh, be experts in wood, going back to, you know, how, um, how that reciprocity comes in. You know, if I make this, each piece that I make, maybe I plant five trees, you know, kind of, I feel like we, we can lead in those, in those demonstrations. So, and think about curriculum building, there's that concept of we need to bring in history. The one I got asked one time is how, uh, how what is it that you need to be a successful designer uh, in, North, in the continent of North America. And I said, you have to know design history before 1492. <laughs> and part of that is, uh, 
one area that uh, we we're missing and what we need, particularly for students to dominate in conversations on appropriation, is those trade routes. And those trade routes is a design system um, and really kind of seeing, you know, uh, there's a few of us are very fortunate to hear stories on uh, either how power regalia is, is, has come um, to be made, how much influence from when Italy, when Italians brought over glass, or if, uh, if we were, uh, you know, if uh, Pueblos were going down to South America and trading macaw feathers, or, you know, I think there's all these beautiful, rich histories that are being missed that are needed to be helpful in these conversations. So I can see multiple curriculums <laughs> being, that need to be made, particularly within design history before 1492. That's one. Another thing is uh, well, the, the snowball's rolling in our sovereignty and how we uh, are able to really demonstrate that in one form. And I do, sorry, I do have to call out York, York University. There's a, a, a woman at York University. She was, we were in this conversation of how we express sovereignty. And one huge indicator of visual sovereignty is how we adorned ourselves. And that could be through hairstyle, uh, particular items that come from, uh, you know, rooted from the, the land. And the response from that woman was, oh, I thought, you know, natives just put on whatever was around them. You know, just like, no, like, just uh, over, over the, um, you know, just flew over her, the concept flew over her head. But in thinking about where we want to go, so think about seven generations ahead, and if we want to be recognized as sovereign nations, we're going to have to really protocol the adornment aspect, that visual, visual sovereignty aspect. And that isn't necessarily with particular, like, uh, you know, clothing, you know, just pa uh, patterns that, you know, might be reflected. And I think we're just, there's just a lot of area, or there's just a lot of knowledge, indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge that can be brought into a curriculum to get these students prepared to go work in a sovereign nation. Um, like one day, like um, I would just love to just live in a world where, um, man, we could be trading as a, as a sovereign nation. Let's say I'm Spirit Lake Dakota. Um, we got beautiful pr purple prairie flowers. Like, why isn't there like a warehouse where we're selling those dyes internationally? Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, at OCAD, I was invited to um, speak at a, a health uh, master's or graduate student's health class. And we talked about like how much could we. Like, we know soil regeneration. You know, we got farmers that, you know, cut down our beautiful prairies and build uh, corn. But, man, if we regenerate that soil, we could be, you know, b growing more sage, you know, having more buffalo, uh, having more, um, you know, just, uh, uh, just industries to sell, like, teas. And we could be selling those to hospitals and whatnot to, you know, bring back diets. So there's just, there's just so much to explore, and I think... Um, that's one of the reasons why, again, I call myself a designer, is uh, you got to design the curriculum before you can even get students into the school. Like, someone's got to design the school, you know, someone's <laughs> got to design the chairs and, and, and uh, everything before you can, you know, get students to walk across the stage. So I think that's um, uh, kind of the aspect of, man, that curriculum's got to get built so we can get more people like Karina and Evan out here and mm -hmm. they can defend themselves better because they all won't be so underrepresented right, anymore. Right, Like resourced, trained, those communicators who are communicating our sovereignty. Um, like, love Christian Allaire, but we need hundreds or thousands of yes. Christian Allaires, right? And, and that's what I love Christian always says, like, I don't want to be the only indigenous right. writer. Yeah. Like, he doesn't please, want, he doesn't want like, please, I need competition. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, so if anybody wants to write about indigenous fashion and you're indigenous, do it. Yeah, we, that's we been a theme. Support. Yeah, that's been a theme. Like, streetwear designers, um, Section 35 and Mobilize, they're like, they're not in competition. And like, Dusty said, like, if you want to open a streetwear brand, do it. Call me, I'll like, give you the tips. Yeah, like, totally. yeah, like, Call us, call Christian. Like we'll, we'll yeah. help you. Um, Christian's sorry. been such a game changer. Yeah, though, for, for sure. Really. Absolutely. Yeah. We yeah. went to That's J a school game together game. back in the day, yeah. and no game changer. So if you guys don't know, Christian yeah. is a writer. Our pal Christian. Christian <laughs> <Lair> is <laughs> this audience right here. Uh, he's a writer for Vogue, and he's um, Ojibwe, and um, 
and it's just like totally changed the game. Like so now my name's been in vogue a couple times because yeah. Christian is just like so incredible and like and I, I think we owe a lot to him. He he gets um embarrassed by that, but I'm really grateful. Literally. The best. No, and I mean like shout out to him because like can you imagine the rooms he's been in? Oh gosh. The no. conversations he's heard about why do we have to feature that? Like Yeah. So I know he's taking care of himself. So, and shout out, he wanted to be here so bad, but uh, yeah. couldn't make it. I just want to um, go back to Sadie, you were mentioning trade routes, and Miigwech for bringing that up. It's such a beautiful concept and a theory, and just to like dwell in what are these trade routes. And I thought about the rivers, and from Bigtagong, you can get anywhere, because you can get to a Great Lake, and then you can get through the Great Lakes, and then you can get anywhere. So I thought of physical trade routes, and how amazing would it be? So we have a beautiful red ochre, like a red rock. So like. We'll make red. You make purple. Who's who's got like orange out there? Like, and and I think about supply chains. Like I think that's what it is. The indigenous supply chain is our hunters, trappers, dying. Like there's so many components of that supply chain. Um, I don't know if I have a question in that, but Evan, moving home, has that been interesting? And like one of my dreams that I want to manifest is like. So Christians everywhere, and every every community gets a Christian or a couple Christians. Every community gets the journalist, but every community has like production factories. Like you mentioned, the dye factory. I would love like a, a factory full of aunties, like and they're sewing, and the Gen Z is doing the TikToks, and the aunties are making it. Like, so what's it been like moving home from like the business side and and production? I get to work with my auntie now. Yes. My aunt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. I, my auntie who taught me how to sew is now working with me in the studio right. and you know she like she, she she doesn't call herself a fashion designer but she's been sewing for her whole life and to me she is a fashion designer she has a designer's mind and she makes you know she'll ask me it's like you're the designer what is what's the finish you want here and I'll tell her and she'll be like no I'm going to do it this way <laughs> <laughs> it's like of course auntie like you, you know you she'll know way better and I'm just I'll just be fiddling over the tiniest little thing and then you know she'll just like it's like the corner of the bottom of that blue jacket was like something that was breaking my brain or the little corner on the cape. And then she just sat at the machine and it was like zip, zip. And wow. it was flip out, perfect. Right. And um, getting to work with her again and, and having more knowledge than the first time around and kind of feeling more like a colleague than a student is really interesting. Mm. And on the other on the other hand, there's no FedEx or UPS or DHL in St. Ambrose, and getting fabrics is very difficult. Um, my cousin got a lot of scary invoices because I had things sent to her house, and then DHL and FedEx would do it in her name. She'd be like, "Why do I need to pay like two hundred dollars in duty? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you need to deal with this." Um, so it's just yeah, it's on that side, it's been really difficult, but. As a result of that, I've kind of cut myself a little bit of slack and mm. pulled myself away again from where I was bending myself towards with being incredibly rigid and wanting everything to be exact, which I really learned from my fashion education in the Western fashion system. Um, and to just allow myself to follow inclinations and these inclinations that I've always had since I was a kid and honoring that little kid inside of me and all of those design decisions that I made as a young person when I wasn't even confident enough to call myself a designer and mm -hmm. honor all of those things that have led me to this point mm -hmm. and take all of those fabrics that I've been kind of hoarding for the last you know, five or six years since I've really started going full tilt with the company and, and again, not, not feel bad like, oh, this, I've shown this before and it's that mentality of it being off trend or you've done it already. Right. You know, it's mm -hmm. like that fabric did not lose its value and its resonance just because it's you know I've yeah. shown it before. Yeah. No, I always say staples. Like there's no there's not nothing wrong with having your staples and yeah. what you always do. I uh, oh sorry. Go oh, ahead. I was gonna say I'm glad you brought up aunties. <laughs> <laughs> auntie <laughs> fashion. Auntie fashion. We were joking. Next year we need auntie fashion oh, panel. Yes. <laughs> and it's just aunties up here like spilling the tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to be there for that. Because. Um, because you're absolutely right, and that, and that concept of being at home, you get to hear stories, and if you and 
and I and I hope I'm speaking to everyone up, uh, who's sitting up here is we admire like our um, elders and elders you know being grandmothers and aunties and uh, Riley was going to ask us a question when we we're talking backstage and um, he said I'm going to ask you what you're wearing and I'm like oh gosh like I don't know like I don't know like names and I um, I probably you know this is probably you know fifteen dollars <laughs> right here but it means that if I am thinking about adorning myself or and thinking about you know what I feel confident in a lot of that you know just pays homage to my aunties and I'm sharing the story of you know, when you're a 90s baby and you grew up with aunties or even grandmothers, um, I want to uh, kind of just touch base on denim, too, is, uh, you know, if I'm sitting at home, you know, having coffee, uh, and mind you, 90s, all my aunties are smoking cigarettes, <laughs> and, like, soup's <laughs> always going, the coffee's always going, you just hear stories, but if you come from elders that, you know, let's say were occupying Wounded Knee or Alcatraz, um, you see pictures of them, and they're in denim, or they're in, you know, very weather uh workwear yeah yeah, yeah camo yeah. man i always thought like those aimsters the american indian movement when they're in camo and they got the red bandanas i was like man that's cool so like dope. just yeah. just pride and, and and strength in that and then um even more so like i uh, i love growing up with aunties who were just again the, the problem of uh, being so underrepresented you know sometimes we identify with another you know brown relation so um, you know, growing up with aunties who were very influenced by Selena and um, just this red lipstick and hoops and a little bit of, you know, Chicana influence in there that, um, you know, we identified with a little bit. So I think we're, we're really unique in a sense where we can bring those stories, um, you know, relatives that have been activists in the past, um, and then also, uh, you know, without appropriating, explaining where, you know, these particular ideas would come from. And, um, yeah, I wish, like, we were, uh, we were talking uh, backstage, and I was like, man, I wish I could just, you know, sit here. I wish my nails were a little bit longer. I wish I had, like, <laughs> my lips were red. I wish I'd be smoking a marble red 100 <laughs> with the bingo dauber bag and the coin purse and the cigarette um, purse, like... That's like what, um, you know, that would be my go-to look. And it doesn't necessarily maybe fit in mainstream media, but it just pays homage to family. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. My thinking on appropriation has changed a little bit, I think, because that's what we did. We get inspiration, and, and as long as you are ethical about it, and mm -hmm. I think that's like that key is you're not exploiting through appropriation, but you're borrowing, getting influence, and, mm -hmm. and you're creating these rad outfits. And acknowledging where it's acknowledging from. Acknowledging where it's yeah, come from. And, and having, often, you know, having relationships with where it comes from as well. And um, so you mentioned denim, and a little bit of like fashion history, that denim was anti-fashion at one point, right? It was mm -hmm. radical to wear denim. It was, you know, on the outside, and, and the fashion industry co-opted that and now there's designer denim now there's fast fashion denim mm -hmm. and so that's what fashion kind of does is like cannibalizes it i think um i didn't know where i was going with this. <laughs> i mean yeah i totally get it <laughs> yeah i agree <laughs> yeah. i'm with you well re resource extraction well one thing i wanted to go back to is we were talking about giving yourself cutting yourself some slack yeah right? okay right. um and and like the resources that are available to you and the more we talk about working from home my mom's gonna continue to ask me to come back home, <laughs> move back to, to the West Coast. Um, but, uh, you know, like when, uh, with, the, with my collections, one thing that the fashion industry changed is that when they would do a completely different collection every season. So, right. then, so then that's why they would outdate things so there's a constant drive to buy something new. And then that devalues the clothes from the previous season, right? And like you said, mm -hmm. the fabric's not, not usable now. Mm -hmm. So that's like I very rarely have sales because everything's made to order. Why would I put it on sale? I don't. I'm not trying to get rid of it. I want to share that work with you, and the, it's not like I'm going to make it worse because it's cheaper. Yeah. Like it, it has that value because of the amount of time and work that you put into it. And and when fast fashion, they're just producing all this crap that's almost basically disposable. Um, but I also, when I design my collections, I, it. I think from the very first thing I ever made until now, it could be one runway show. Mm. And, and like, so I'm not changing who I am every season. So I'm not, I, and I want to add value to all the pieces, whether or not they're archival. And I, and I intentionally don't put the date on um, collections or, do, or call it fall, winter, or call it spring, summer, because I want it to be 
you know, if you want this jacket, you have two years to save up to buy it. It'll still be available, yeah, you know? Right. Like, yeah, that's, so I, I don't like the devaluation of clothing, I guess. The red and black will always be there because I'm saving up for it. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah as long as the, <laughs> so the company keeps <laughs> making it. I'm sure, you know, that I'm helping them out by buying so much fabric. So, yeah, right. but yeah. Um, your brain, brain, yeah, your that was up. I had something great to respond to you, and I was just like, that was cool. Oh, we're talking about what's doing collection, sustainability, fast fashion. Oh, yes, like, um, so building, and oh, so, yes, it was. Thank you so much. Um, time, it's a different conception of time. Mm. It's an indigenous conception of time right. to not date something and historicize something right. because there's a circular model to time, so everything is circular. And so that notion of like, and that's why fashion gets into trouble because they need the next season, right? Mm -hmm. Like the runway happens, they're, they're already working two, three seasons ahead to find what's next and oh, we need inspiration for this season. Uh, let's look, the natives, they look cool this season. Let's mm -hmm. get inspiration for them. So mm -hmm. if you don't have that pressure and that speed. Mm -hmm. And Evan, you've always kind of had that model of kind of slower and made to order. Yeah, I, by virtue of the fact that I couldn't, you know, Early on, when like I said, I wanted to make the empire. That was, you know, when I first was in fashion school and just finishing fashion school and not really along my my own personal decolonization journey and learning more about my own the own the interlocking systems of domination that created my life and my situation in in my community, have, and having a better understanding of that going forward, it just felt natural. And also, I, I also need to shout out working at Eco Fashion Week with Miriam LaRoche in Vancouver, who, um, before anyone else really, before the Eco Fashion was even a conversation, was going into boardrooms and going into magazines and bringing this up and was really formidable in my education about Eco Fashion and really how yeah. harmful fashion is to the planet. Um, so I was lucky enough early on from there to have that kind of education, but then also move forward and not have that capacity and need, needing to build something that was going to work with one, maybe two people in mm -hmm. production. And I think it, I think it kind of worked, guys. I think it kind of worked. Yes. I think it kind of worked. <laughs> yeah. I, I think about that so often because I, I work solo. I have an assistant that comes in two days a week. Um, but it, it's it's exhausting, and now I'm like, I'm, is my success tied to my own exploitation now? And yeah. because I can only do so much, right, you know. Right. And so, I, I I'm still trying to figure it out. I think there's still we still got a ways to go. And a big part of that is money, you know. Mm -hmm. like, we, like you said, grant writing because it's an e-commerce business. Right. They don't you, there's not a lot of grants available for fashion designers, but fashion designers are not born rich. Right. Um, so Some of them are. Yes, yeah, some of them are. They're the very <laughs> yeah. lucky ones. The, lucky the successful ones. ones. Yeah. The ones that you know their names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, they're one, the ones with an the ones LLC. That are born rich. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. Do we want to chat? I mean, some people might be wondering about the Met. Yeah. The Metropolitan <laughs> the Museum Metropolitan of Art. The Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a little, little gallery in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you've been. Um, <laughs> Do you want to talk about how that came to be? Maybe a bit of context that so that there was American fashion and then it didn't include <laughs> any Native Americans <laughs> and then they did it yeah. the second time. But yeah, how did that happen or what went down? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll start. Yeah. Um, so uh, I got contacted in. Uh, uh, so okay, let's see. So the Met the Met has uh, uh, the Met Gala usually t usually once a year in May. They decided this year to throw one in in. Um, September during Fashion Week uh, because of the missed galas uh, previously with COVID. So they did two two big openings this year. And the show was called America, a Lexicon of Fashion. And they wanted to bring in a bunch of um, like smaller designers who are really like uh, socially impactful, I guess, and, and share their work uh, in the first part of the exhibition. Um, I got contacted in late July. Um, they wanted to pull a piece that I had made uh, out of like a Hudson Bay print. And it was a conversation on uh, the reclamation of the Hudson Bay Company where my, um, my four-time great-grandfather worked for Hudson Bay Company. Um, his name was Onawaskam. And he was a canoe middleman for the, so, you know, helping them basically get, get around. Um, 
And so the, the, that piece was a conversation on that reflection of my own family history. Um, and then also just starting that discussion about the uh, colonialism in fashion through the Hudson Bay Company. Um, so, that was, so they wanted to pull that piece, but the conversation behind it came, developed uh, after they pulled it, right? So I was like, well, this is what it means and you need to know all of this and this is why I did it and da 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 da. So they put it in the show. I, I really felt like it was an afterthought because I was contacted in late July and the show opened in September. And so I already felt a little bit strange. And then, um, yeah, communication was, was very interesting. Uh, they came, picked up the piece, pulled it, put it in the show. Um, and then that was just like so weird. I had a lot of conversations with uh, Patricia Norby, who's the curator at the Met, and Andrew Bolton um, about the fact that only one indigenous designer was included, which was me. I had no idea until the opening of the show who was in the show. And I said, out of 100 looks, we're still only 1% of the show. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, what a missed opportunity. You're doing it. You're doing it. Curating the Met Costume Institute on American fashion, and you don't include the best, the first uh, American designers, indigenous people, not even represented. So you came out. Uh, a friend of mine who works for New York Magazine, we called them out publicly, and we're like, 1%, wow. So they're like, oh, we're so sorry, we were gonna include people in the second round. So then that's when yeah. you come in. And that's when I got round. an email in November. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, right off the bat, it was, you know, we're gonna include you, but you're not gonna be involved in this. Um, you're not gonna be in the catalog, but you will be in the exhibition, and the first look that they had requested doesn't exist anymore. People, I've, it, it's been, one piece was stolen from a fashion show and the other one I gifted away years ago. And I was a little surprised that, about what they wanted. They wanted things that were very, um, for lack of a better word, basic. Like things mm -hmm. that, like early on in my career that really had nothing to do, I suppose, with my indigeneity and... Um, not, the not, not the census anyway. print. Not census print, no right. embroidery. Um, and then the second outfit that they wanted was, I sent they they sent the whole I sent them the whole image of the the original outfit, which is the black embroidered T-shirt, the original right. one that I've done, and us like the canvas skirt, which is in the museum. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, they didn't want the T-shirt; they only wanted the skirt. And I was like, okay, so this mannequin's going to be wearing no yeah. shirt amongst all of these like fully clad right. designers That's from gross. all around the world. And then I get. I get the the measurements for the mannequin, and the mannequins were called tribal or tribe Stop. or something. Oh yeah, so it was just little 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 digs all along the process, and then microaggressions. Microaggressions, yes. yeah. 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 And as we get to the to when the the piece was going to be included, I get an image, and I'm convinced that they just pulled it out of the FedEx box and threw it on a mannequin because there was insane wrinkles like it didn't look anything like the photos I sent them they requested photos of it displayed so that they could replicate it in the exhibition and it looked nothing like it it was because it, it had all of this horse hair in the hem and if once it's all bent and shoved in a box for like four days to travel from Winnipeg to New York um, it, it's I was like this is the costume Institute this is where they this is, this is their modus operandi. Yeah. This is what they do. This, they're the experts on this, and no one could even take a press, could impress right. the skirt out right. before they threw on a mannequin. Mm. Yeah, I, I sent a very detailed email, and it was Good. quickly and swiftly fixed. Yeah. Okay. And now it's and the way it's exhibited now is the way is it was originally intention? supposed to be done. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that's it's so crazy, right? So if you didn't say anything, do you think you I don't think I would? I don't think I would have been I, asked. I, I, don't yeah. I, I don't know. I'd be curious yeah. to it's hear, like, um, you know, if if I am speaking up or if I'm being a little bit stern, and if it rubs somebody the wrong way, mm. like. Um, but at the end of the day, we're we're just trying to bring voice to the table, or you right. know, like. Yeah. Um, but in thinking about reputation, like, what do you if if I am going to be a little bit more outspoken, or I might be, and someone might say that, oh, you're you know a little bit more outspoken, or give you a little bit more of a negative connotation when you're you don't know me personally. Like, how do you feel when you might be in that situation of mm -hmm. um, you know you wanting to stand up for um, mm -hmm. all of us, but yet someone be like, oh, I'm not going to work with her because she's. Right. 
like rude or you know what I'm you know what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh totally. Yeah, I yeah. and and I and I'm like I mean one of the songs I used in my show last night was my attitude, you know, bitch I've got an attitude, so what I've got an attitude. And it's and it's kinda like that's why well, how do we define ourselves? I, I don't really think of myself as an activist, right? That's like right, so that's I say word, yeah. that's that's a byline on somebody else's paper on, under my name. Because I speak up for what I think is <laughs> what, you know, I hold people accountable, challenge people to do better. I'm not complaining. There's, you know, I don't want it to come off as a complaint, but it, I think that we do need to challenge these huge museums and stuff to have better relationships with indigenous people because their relationships are not good, you know? And like, uh, and this, it's just like all, I, they just got an indigenous curator just this year. At the, um, at the was, Met. My yeah. question is, were you working with an indigenous curator? No. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but I have been in contact with Patricia Norby, but yeah, it's, it's um, interesting. I'm grateful for it, but it's oh, a, there's a story yeah. alongside it, yeah. Right. Like, back to that it's original bittersweet, tension. for sure. Yeah. It was a very bittersweet mm-hmm. situation to know that. You know, I had no control over how it was displayed, and had it had been up for a week already in that state, and <sighs> that it was that was my name underneath it, and that's how I was represented mm-hmm. on that scale next to all of these designers, you know, the storied designers of American fashion who had been right. given every you know every concession, mm-hmm. every invite, every everything for this entire process, and you know, I felt like. They didn't even pull out a steamer. Come on, right, <laughs> come right. on. You deserve better. <laughs> it's, it's respect. It's a yes, lack of respect. Is, yes. yeah. Like bust out the white gloves. Exactly. Like compensate you for like proper shipping. Like take care. There was no care in that. Well, there wasn't a relationship, and there was no care, even if there was like a, a hint at a relationship. Wow, my like anxiety. I was like breathing there. Like, <laughs> it's gross. It's wild. It's yeah. like. So many little fuck ups in the minute. But you said you sixty percent of partnerships you'll say no to or something like that. Yeah, I get emails constantly. Yeah. Constantly. And then it'll be like, Well, we want to feature you. I gotta um I don't can I whatever. <laughs> it's just a small small group of us. And online. Uh, like, and, like and Pan, Pantone <laughs> Pantone wanted me to they were like, we want to share your work. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And they're like, Can you just answer a couple questions? I thought it was gonna be like name, whatever. And the first question it was like it was like um, how do you feel about N- National Native American Citizenship Day? And I was like, what? About <laughs> Pantene? I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of feelings about it. So like, now, now I have to be an expert on fucking Native American right. Citizenship Day. Right. It's like, so that's the only reason you want to share my work because it happened to fall on June 2nd and you're like, oh, this, this is a native designer. Right. But like those kinds of opportunities, it's like, why? Like, right. yeah, and they have 3 million followers. That would have been cool, but... Why, like, why do I have to right, do that? Right. Why do I have to jump through these weird hoops? And, and it's like, why can't you just share? And, yeah. and, and I don't have to educate you. And I don't have to pu- pu- pull all... It's, it's resource extraction from our yeah. bodies. It's an invasive question yeah. Yeah, masqueraded yeah. as you know, an opportunity. Exactly. I think it's, someone, weird. it's wild. Someone should write the book on the hoops. Because the hoops you have to jump through. Yesterday, <laughs> Dusty said he was doing a mural for 7-Eleven. And it was like an indigenous mural painted by youth. And at the end, 7-Eleven asked them to like insert more Slurpees into the mural. Because <laughs> it was like That's National amazing. Slurpee Day. It was National <laughs> Slurpee Day. No. And they wanted more Slurpees. But like, mm. yeah, like start like a, let's start a meme account of like those funny, horrible things that brands ask you to do. Oh my gosh, that would be hilarious. That's wild. But um, so yeah, Happy Met happened. Again, that, so I was saying that tension, right? It's mm-hmm. like you're participating, you're dipping your toes in, but mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be an unsafe place at times. And, but I'm hearing also sticking with your values, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It is going to be that kind of guiding to make sure you're not going too, too astray. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm so grateful for like this indigenous fashion arts is that, you know, we're building our own spaces now. Mm-hmm. Instead of trying, like, we keep trying to get into these spaces, keep trying to get in. And a lot of artists, a lot of indigenous artists intentionally will not work with certain museums. Um, but now, that then once you get in and you're like, oh, this feels yeah. bad. Yeah. Like, so, but this feels great. Right, we, right. We're just keep hanging out and like we're peers. We're, you know, we're part of similar communities and yeah, it's great. Right, right. So, mm-hmm. More joy and yeah, more of our own spaces and mm-hmm. the visiting is so key to spending time with each other as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- there is going to be a chance for some audience questions. So maybe um, start thinking about that to, if you have something to ask. And there is going to be a mic at the back, um, which we'll have to use. But to everyone on the panel, I'll pose the question, um, what do you need? 
do you need something from the establishment? Um, maybe this is a question about you know future manifestations, what you'd like to see. Um, yeah. Mm. Money. I need money. Money? <laughs> yeah, two points. Yeah, I need them to get their boot off my neck. Right. What do you mean? And it, the, the restrictions, the constraints of the industry. And um, an example, working with stylists and having to spend all of this insane amount of money on shipping to something where you never know if anything's right. even going to be used. Um, that's one, like, that, there's the, those little systems, those exclusionary systems that are built around, you know, conglomerate companies that have billion dollar marketing budgets who can send, you know, endless amounts of clothes around the world for all of these opportunities, whereas we have maybe one sample in one size, and if you want that piece, it's going to be a custom, or you're just going to have to pick something else, you know. Um, and then secondly, I want an abundance of sufficiency. <laughs> <laughs> I want, I just want to try and, I know that, that I'm never going to have, it's never going to be completely in balance. I'm always going to be a little bit overtired or I'm always going to feel like I'm not doing enough, but I just want to try and maintain right. that. I feel like we're the same person. <laughs> I, like everything you say, I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sounds like you're doing it, yeah, moving home though. Definitely. That was a big part of it, you know, um, and and it was, it was, I was at home when I got asked to do the mat. I was like, woke up in my childhood bedroom. You know, you never think like going home at nearly 30, it, there's all these connotations of failure and feelings of failure and not being able to cut it and not being able to, to work hard enough or do enough to, you know, maintain your life in a big city. But going home, it reminded me of all of these things that, like I said, that I had kind of missed out on and getting that call at the Met and going through that process and it's just like, damn, like, I, I got this, but like, I, just to get at that moment, I missed it on so many things, like being called uncle or auntie, depending on which <laughs> niece and nephew Depending on the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that, that, that to me just kind of, yeah, it just kind of put everything into perspective. Right, right. I, and sorry, Tangent, I, yeah, I moved home two years ago mm -hmm. for the pandemic. And I surprised myself, I surprised my parents, because I left high school to go to Toronto, and they thought, you're moving, you're moving there? <laughs> like, you're, mov you're moving back to a small town in the north? And, and I love it there, and it's just the energy. Like, I can be on the land. I can teach my class on Zoom and be on the land. And, like, to be there and be building relationships and getting to know my territory, like, that is what is important for mm -hmm. my own, as an educator. That is what I need to be doing to be teaching myself. But yeah, so I, like, I'm right with you, and I can't wait to visit you in St. Ambrose. Yes, come visit. <laughs> Sadie, future manifestations, oh, what do you need? I need those curriculums. I right? need them, need them. If we got to get Evan's empire going, we got to <laughs> get <laughs> these students ready. And even just the space, I think about it all the time. Like, if I were to build a design institute specifically for, you know, indig the indigenous demographic, um, you know, what would it look like? What would it be? Where would it be? And I just think about, you know, just all the, the hoops or the social justice uh, hurdles that we have to just cross to even get a blueprint made and to, to know. But I, um, I think in our lifetimes, if we see it, um, I would love to have that curriculum. We need uh, just even all, in a fashion institute, uh, you know, design college or... Mm -hmm. um, uh, whatever it may be, and I, um, and the next thing that I would need is I need people to understand what sovereignty means. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, there's uh, there's a lot of confusion, or maybe the concept people are still uh, starting to grasp the concept, but. Um, to go back to the point that you started out and talking about diversity. There's so much diversity, and I think what the challenge is, what you two just spoke on is um, we're speaking for a panned demographic, and it's hard. Mm. And in to order to get out of that pan, you have to... And again, I question this all the time. Like, when I'm laying in bed and my mind's just going, I'm just like, oh, like, how do we get people to understand each nation? It's like, right. I'm if, if I'm taking geography class, I'm expected to... Um, you know, all know all the little countries or pronunciations within Asia or Europe even, but it's just 
uh, you know, do we need to design a map? Do we need to give like a, maybe our own like magazine line where each is a, this is a specific region? Like the, the opportunities are out there, but curriculum and folks, you gotta understand sovereignty. And what is nice in my experience going between the United States and Canada is Canada is really good at communicating um, these terminologies. Still yet to see a little bit more practice on, on some of this, but even more so more progressive than the United States than then. Um, you know, if you take the borders out, we still have our relatives in Mexico that are, aren't even federally recognized yet. So right. I think um, it's just, you know, to, to sit on a panel like this, and I think there's a lot of trust in being role models on how, uh, what is going to be expected for the two nations, two larger nations below us. So. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Any other future manifestations? Um, you know, I, I like we were talking about the empire thing. I, I think I had my senior quote or something when I graduated high school said I want, I want to build an empire. I wanted to be like Coco Chanel, you know. Mm -hmm. And but I think a lot of, like a lot of the way that I work is that old school kind of fashion couturier kind of yeah. deal. And I really like that, you know. And then I have so much more respect for the way garments are made because I'm making them and I know how hard it is. <laughs> You know, so the clothes don't cost anything. But now my goal, what I really, really am like trying to manifest and envisioning for myself is just to have a small studio and be able to pay a team of people. And like that's really my like main mm -hmm. goal. And if I could get health insurance, <laughs> that'd be amazing. Yeah. Like, right, I live in New York, so it's rough. Right. But yeah, um, that, that's what I would just love to be able to um, support other people, right, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, part of the process of this festival, so I'm on the board of IFA, and we're gonna, we have been asking lots of questions, and we're thinking about an association or a union or something like that. To you know, can we get healthcare? Can we get a pension? And can we collaborate on supply chains? And so, we're getting, we're getting together and we're assembling and, and gonna have start having those conversations. And I'm excited to hear how that develops. Um, I was wondering what I needed, but I, I think we're in the same boat. Like curriculum, mm -hmm. I want like the school of indigenous fashion, but I also want like hundreds of them, right? Like everywhere, mm. kind of, yeah. And then I was thinking about this urban home divide, right? Like I don't think you should have to go to an urban center to be successful. Coming home shouldn't feel like being unsuccessful, mm. but like to have fluidity, to visit with other nations and to go home and to have that mobility. Mobility is probably something that I want. Mm. Um, I forgot to mention that I am wearing Justine Woods. Sorry. <laughs> She's probably in the audience is like, if Riley doesn't mean no, she, not, she wouldn't. Uh, Justine Woods so was trained in menswear um, and also uh, is Metis and did the beadwork. Um, and there's a, there's a harness. Uh, this is from Northbound, which is a great leather studio here in Toronto. But I also want to manifest more indigenous made harnesses. I want like hide <laughs> harnesses and, and all that. And Evan's wheels are turning right now. <laughs> but they, they're out there. Sage made a harness. Sage mm -hmm. did a harness. A couple, of, yeah. Anyway, I'm manifesting that. Um, was that 10 minutes total? My stage manager's like giving me cues. Is that 10 minutes total or? <laughs> to the Q&A? Oh, we got lots of time. Mm -hmm. Oh, lots of time. Okay. okay. Um, were there any questions from the audience? Um, oh, is there people in the line? Yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, we got excited over here. Um, <laughs> Hello, who are you and again, your question? How are you? Um, I'm still Yolanda here. I just want to say that, oh my goodness, your outfits are amazing. <laughs> and um, I really love that you put like the t-shirt with like all that extra, like I love it. Like you just guys look amazing. <laughs> um, I totally just take that off of you right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I just want to say like what I really enjoyed about this panel. So I don't have a question per se, but a comment. Like I love that your past and future are colliding and like you're making sure that it's all generated and shown. So what I'm saying is like all the, the runways, and you see the, the, the future of fashion for indi indigenous, as well as you see the past. And I think that is mm -hmm. just amazing that you're not losing mm -hmm. what you had and still bring into the future. Like you said, like they just want to see um, us in tribal gear or, or something like that, where you're just saying, no, this isn't a costume. Mm -hmm. This is a, for a reason. And we also do this. We're also moving into streetwear. And so stop trying to put us in a little box or put you in a little box, I should mm -hmm. say, because um, I just really appreciate 
listening to all the panels and being able to be here. Thank you. Miigwech, any you. thoughts? Cool. Miigwech for that. Any thoughts on past and future? Um, I, I love I love that narrative that it is like a mm -hmm. like full. I mean, because you know you think so much about future generations and preparing preparing this industry. We're knocking down a couple walls so, so other people don't have to push so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. Very often, this, the, the state of being indigenous is that you're always tasked with carrying the past and the present together all at once. Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely brought that into my collection that I showed on Thursday, where I, I, I use this kind of thought process of a, an indigenous person from this time period with the ability to time travel and going back to all of these different areas, eras of colonial time and picking and taking things from these different area, eras and bringing them back with them to now. Much in the same way that white set, that settler culture has, you know, picked and picked and picked. I just myself went through the, you know, European historical dress and Whoa. picked and picked and picked and did what I, all these little inclinations that I wanted to see mm -hmm. together. Things that have always been just kind of brewing in my mind that these little connections between like Italian Renaissance and Georgian England and uh, you know liturgical um, papal garments from antiquity and wow. Grecian drapes, draping and you know all of it coming together all at once and also the way that my family dressed and the way that they, they had to dress themselves to go to work. Workwear is a big part of my brand and in, it's, it's a nice through line throughout all of it, even in the evening wear and using heavy canvas fabrics in evening wear. Um, just, you know, taking all of these things that have made me, that have made me me and honoring them, like I said before, and honoring all those inclinations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say the, um, the respect of, of um, uh, fashion being an educational tool mm -hmm. um, and really... Uh, I feel like that's a strong visual tool to really uh, educate folks on particular uh, histories. So, for example, let's say that um, you might have little, you talked about just little details in, in some of your work. Maybe it's just like a little detail of like an elk tooth. And then maybe someone asked you, oh, you know, what was, you know, what is, was the significance of that piece? And that opens up the door opportunity to educate and think about, oh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe somebody will have, you know, great interest in wanting to know, you know, why are elk teeth so, uh, I want to say that, royal or so, um, you know, very uh, high in material. It's a little bit harder to get elk teeth. So I was like, I would love to, um, you know, be up here adorned in, in elk teeth better, better than gold. But just even like, I, I, I like that, that narrative as well as I see fashion as a strong tool to really start educating those histories and, um, and just to see, and for people who do recognize those details that continue to ask questions because that will allow the, the history side of what we talked about to be more mm -hmm. present and hopefully mm -hmm. uh, be more exposure to, to that history. Mm. You got me thinking that maybe that's why we have less like less looks on the runway because there's so much to each of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many stories within each garment. Like, how could you possibly pump out 100 looks? Like, what are they? What are you going to be saying for that? Like, let me try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so moving slower and, and less. Really interesting. Hi. White Hohuatept, Buffalo, and Squest Te Te Kamloops is Suihen. I have a bit of a three-part question, but number one, um, hashtag indigenous renaissance is what I've been using. Ooh. And exactly. And so I think of myself as a renaissance person. Um, I'm a civil engineer by trade. I work with an architectural firm and we do a lot of indigenous projects. So I'm hoping your vision of having a fashion institute <laughs> would be well fitting to work with me and my team. Cool. So definitely, I'll hand out my card to you after. <laughs> okay. And it's time, like, this is Indigenous Renaissance. We have lawyers, we have doctors, we have engineers, right. we have designers. We have everything we need to build the infrastructure that we want to have for our community, mm -hmm. whether it be here in uh, Karanta or on the West Coast, where I'm from. So I'm Coast Salish, mm -hmm. so similar to, to you. Yeah. We have a tradition um, of fashion, and I wanted to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So the, the two items that I wanted to talk about are our traditional 
way of burying our leaders was to create stone beads, handmade. You can imagine how long it would take to make one bead, mm -hmm. maybe a day. And our greatest leaders have been discovered through archaeology to have over 10,000 beads on their vest to represent how valuable they were to our community and how much we contributed as, an, as a group to make those beads in production, mass production for such a ceremony. Um, I love the fact that you guys talked about ochre. So in, in my territory, we have red, black, and, and yellow ochre that we use to dye our clothes and we use for traditional ceremonies. It's also for protect, protection. So the adornment of protection, not just a breastplate, but spiritual protection. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's great that you touched on that topic. And also the mountain goat in mm -hmm. our territory. We had the mountain goat and we used that to harvest um, ethically. We, would, we wouldn't take the mountain goat and kill it to create the wool that we use. We actually pick the tufts off the bushes. So we were harvesting mm -hmm. them ethically such that they would live. Um, we also created the woolly dog. Mm -hmm. So right. on islands, we would keep these dogs Let's that were woolly yeah. and we would harvest them to make uh, blankets. So our, in our culture, we use blankets for honoring our elders and leaders. Mm -hmm. So we also did that ethically. Um, so it's awesome that you, you all touched on those topics. Um, and then I guess one final thing about our traditional um, regalia is that grass dancers originally in the uh, Stony Nakoda version that I've been taught use scalps on, mm. their, on their waist to do the ceremony. And the grass dance was meant to, um, to, to uh, protect the area and open it up spiritually for the camp and they would go and stomp the ground. But they had the scalps of their uh, enemies um, with them. So that was pretty amazing that you brought up scalps and the skeletons as well. It's pretty badass to bring up scalps <laughs> in the panel, yeah. <laughs> so so that's, where, that's, that's just a little bit of history of our um, indigenous fashion and, and specifically speaking from the West Coast. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for having this uh, discussion. And then my question is, how would you incorporate some of those into your um, designs. So whether it be scalps or pretend scalps or ochre, uh, maybe using ochre for dyeing mm -hmm. your fabrics. Anybody? Uh, well, Miigwech for saying all that and it just reminded mm -hmm. me that we need the, all those stories, right? Mm -hmm. Like we need, those are from your territory, so we need to hear all of those incredible material stories and where that comes from. But I imagine, are all of you open to to finding yeah. those and remembering those. And I'm very excited for trapping season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely going to be going to the, uh, the Trappers Association and right, getting, yeah. in at, getting into that market. Yeah. Um, getting all On the woolly dog, and same thing with um, like mm -hmm. mush dogs and Inuit. It was well, a, I mean, like our mink population was completely decimated. Right. You know, like mink is a big part of our creation stories, and now they're don't, they don't even exist in those territories now. Yeah, yeah. But I forgot, I, to men I forgot to mention. So I'm wearing uh, these sealskin earrings, mm -hmm. and they're by stitched by April. 
I think she has a booth here. Cool. And section 35, it's yep. a old school, it's the face puller. Right. Yeah. So that's a Blackfoot designer uh, yeah. that worked with Justin. When is section 35 showing? The no, Sunday, I think, with Mobilize. Yeah. Okay. I want to, uh, before we go to the next question, kind of uh, just ex you know, share that, that uh, there's a lot of, in our work, there's a lot of breaking of stereotypes. So in thinking about, I think there's, for the non-Indigenous people who are maybe have some type of fear, <laughs> or like, you know, might think things are a little bit more odd or quirky, like maybe having some enemy scalp on you. And I think um, how, you know, when I try to storytell in my classroom, you know, for example, we're talking about, so I can't see, <laughs> uh, where the, uh, talking about architecture and thinking about, you know, if, let's say, uh, you, you bring in a team of native designers to work in a populist area to talk about, you know, building shelter for homeless. And immediately my, you know, answer would be, well, you know, let's, let's, let's build teepees. But in thinking about, um, you know, not so much, it doesn't have to look like a teepee, but the science of why, uh, you know, buffalo skin is climate change. It would protect somebody, you know, it'd be take the, the inventor to think about, okay, if it doesn't look like a teepee, you know, how could we incorporate uh, the, the skin to be insulator, um, to be protective in um, very extreme hot weather and, and cold weather too. Uh, so, but I think, you know, when we bring these ideas, I think people kind of get grossed out a little bit sometimes. Mm. They're like, ooh, like, does it, is it going to stink in there? Or like, is it, he does. like, I don't want to, like, yeah. live in animal skin, you know, I want to, you know, I want a condo. But I think it's just really breaking <laughs> oh that, uh, that's just that notion of, like, our, our science isn't yeah. too odd. It could be helpful. We just live in a very yeah. colonial world where right. we're still kind of, like, they kind of shit on our ideas mm, yet. Right. But right. hopefully... You could change yeah. that. The science is brilliant. Like an Inuit sealskin parka is like way better than any Gore-Tex, Canada Goose stuff down. Like it is the most, it's like such a brilliant thing. And, and that is, like that's why actually I, I taught a history of design course and that's what I tried to do is insert the science and the brilliance of mm -hmm. indigenous ingenuity. And then one, one more point before the next question. In the Renaissance, the artists had the Medicis, the banks, to bankroll the Renaissance and the science and the arts and that. So we need money. We need money, honey. Hi. Hi. So my name is Athena. I'm the founder for a project that's called No Name, Just People. Um, I'm not indigenous, but I do work with indigenous communities and, and artisans, especially in Latin America. So I guess my question is, yeah, you guys are all indigenous and somehow you were lucky enough to be born in a country, um, a developed country, and uh, you, were, you all had access to like an education, and you're able to be here like in a panel, and you're educated enough to sort of like have a discussion around indigenous fashion. Um, but in Latin America, indigenous communities are, like the conditions this community live, live in are like extreme poverty conditions. Um, these indigenous people, they would like never be able to like sit on a panel and have a discussion and like, um, yeah, they don't have the education, in, enough education to do that. So um, like my project and what we do is that we try to like collaborate with them and sort of like, for, for example, a jacket that I'm wearing, it's from a community that they've been doing hammocks for thousands of years. So we went in the community and we sort of like had a discussion with the artisans and we were like, let's create jackets, let's create clothing, let's try to like innovate a little what you guys do. So my question is like, what do you think about non-indigenous designers, like such as myself maybe, like working with indigenous communities and like, I don't want to say using, but like creating with your fabrics and with what you do? Um, I can speak on that a little bit. Um, just in last year, was it last year the, we did this collaboration with Simons, who I feel really sent a president for how um, non-Indigenous entities can work with Indigenous communities. There was such an amazing dialogue and um, we were all compensated proportionally for what the amount of work we were going to be putting into it and had an in, like, a great amount of freedom with what we were going to present and what was going to be available for purchase. Um, so I think those are the, really the parameters that need to be put into place is this absolute sovereignty over your 
over your nation and its cultural iconography, and to have the final word and the final say. Is OCN here? Hi, OCN. OCN was the, my point of contact for the Simons project. Um, and that, yeah, that, that to me felt like, yeah, there, of course, I was a little hesitant moving in. You know, it was, it was my first big contract with a, um, with a, with a, a retailer. And I, all of that kind of evaporated as the process went on. Of course, there was things to, that, that really were difficult to deal with because of the pandemic, but we were all dealing with it in, time, in kind. And throughout the process, it was, you know, everything kind of ironed itself out in time. Yeah, I want to speak on that too yeah. because I, I I see those collaborations and even respectful allyship as exposure for us. Like I said, we're so mm -hmm. underrepresented. And uh, to give a shout out to Hyphen Reads, Hyphen Reads uh, uh, creator Heather is of Korean descent, and she said that her father was uh, allowing, meaning you know, being in a position to give up his power, using his money to produce books written in Korean to translate all indigenous authors. Now, it's a long, it's a long, that's going to be a long project to do, but the reasoning for that work was uh, you know, outside of the continent of North America. There's just not literature, there's not you know, journals, there's not any other educational devices, whether that's through reading, or uh, you know, just either shows or exhibits or whatever it may be. There, um, I see that. Um, to answer your, your question, is I see those um, opportunities to you know take our voices afar and to educate. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought Hyphen Reads being a bookstore and you know being an ally to you know we know how powerful a book is um, to really you know, express our culture in areas where we can't physically be, or even to maybe, you know, if people still think we exist or extinct globally, mm. um, you know, those opportunities allow us to, to, to be existent. So I'm, um, yeah, so I, I, I see it in that notion. I can see how uh, people can say, you know, not talking about hyphen reads, but, you know, I can see how maybe other entities might have good intentions, but then they don't become a respectful ally, then they go in the realm of exploitation. So, um, but then also I, I just appreciate you mentioning about, you know, just indigeneity down south and more impoverished areas where, um, because culture is really still intact, you know, thinking about, and even to think about the whole deforestation that's going on in the Amazon, like there's still uh, cultural values that speak to us up here, and um, and that's a strong connection that we have, which we got through trade <laughs> too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, yeah, Jimmy, just thank you so much um, for injecting a, a healthy dose of humility. Um, thank you so much for that. It, it goes without saying, but you also need to say it that mm -hmm. many of our communities live in poverty, don't mm -hmm. have clean drinking water. There are those issues that we as a fashion movement can can help with and and that's i think you know what our contributions can be is helping those communities i love this respectful allyship i think that's a great term i know incredible non-indigenous allies who help create the platforms or they they get the mic and then they pass the mic mm -hmm. right they set up the room i think maybe Dor oh dory's there <laughs> you know they like <laughs> they, they get the room set up and then they pass the mic to the indigenous people so making sure that in any kind of allyship that you're doing, that it's indigenous-led, right? That you're listening and it's indigenous people asking for something, right? Not assuming that, um, you know, they need this and, and you go out without really that dialogue and communication. Um, yeah, and like, so I know, I think you're, that's amazing to hear and I think you're a really great connector, right? And it's, you, you use the word innovative or innovating to like, so they've always been weaving this way, but oh, if you just weave a jacket, we can do this, and then I can take it to this market over here. And I think there's lots of room for that kind of internationalism as well. Like, mm -hmm. can we connect um, indigenous artisans everywhere? And like, that's the beautiful thing about the market is you can command higher prices here in, in downtown Toronto. So can we bring those products to the, you know, the luxury streets and urban centers and, and get what they're worth? Um, so like, there's a, that's a job for an ally right there is, mm -hmm. you know, like mm. buyers to help get us to those markets to command those prices. Like, yeah, there's, there's so much room for that respectful allyship. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Miigwech for the question. I feel so short. Hi, Dory Hunstall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to 
I mean, I think this is kind of leading to what I was wanting to ask about. Less so, I think, allyship, but more about kind of solidarity. Right. And and because one one of the things I find kind of fascinating as I bounce around different spheres is like like there's a sense in which when we talk, and by we I say like we racialize and indigenous people, um, that when we talk we kind of talk in the frame of like our place and community, and then we talk about structures of like colonization, which is normally talking about sort of whiteness, right? And I'm also I'm interested in kind of like how do we think about or how we approach solidarity in, on a community level. Like I always think like allyship is like on an individual level, but I'm, I'm interested in what your thoughts are about solidarity on a community level in the sense of like, like I think in some of the conversations like, like hip hop as a forum has create a context of for solidarity <laughs> and expression between various different communities and like it's a global phenomenon, whatever. But I, I'm interested in what your thoughts are about solidarity on a sort of community level and particularly in sort of black communities and mm -hmm. indigenous communities because it seems that in our complaint structure, we're always talking about whiteness to a certain extent, but I also think it's interesting. But part of those structures were setting up barriers of solidarity between specific communities. And so how do we begin to move in a solidarity front community community in that way? I know I'm not doing enough. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm perfectly honest. Like, I know I'm not doing enough, right? And I, I would... But there's also a reason why, and sorry, I'm jumping in first, but um, like colonization separated people, right? We weren't allowed to gather so we could talk and strategize and figure out how we're gonna defeat the colonizers. And so it's true that indigenous nations don't talk to enough to each other and we need more internationalism, but it's also true of black communities. And um, Toronto has African Fashion Week and like, why aren't we coinciding? Why, where, like, where's the panel where we're talking to each other and we absolutely need it and so, no, like, thank you for bringing it up, and it's it's top of mind for me, and we don't do it enough. I, Sadia. Yeah, I, um, so I'm trying to uh, uh, kind of gather this statement so it's, uh, so folks can understand, but when I'm thinking of an example of where you might see two opposite communities come together and work together, when you take out, you know, the terminology around colonization, you take away, you know, you're taking out, um, you know, color of skin, and thinking about when you bring these two forces together, why would they work well? And let me give an example, like cowboys versus Indians. Mm -hmm. So coming from the Dakotas and knowing that there's a strong um, homesteading culture. So think about those in their covered wagons, they sell Dance of the Wolves, or when they come together, it's, and to see how those two interactions kind of morphed in, in, in kind of transitioned into um, now it's not so much about, I mean, you can go home at the end of the day, have your beliefs, you can be a little bit more liberal, you can be a little bit more conservative, but at the end of the day, um, if you're ranching or if you're herding, you're protecting that soil. Um, and, and, and thinking about when homesteaders and indigenous tribes in the prairie area work together, you see a little bit unique fashion sense come out. So when uh, Karina was talking about Pendleton, mm -hmm. They're in thinking about, I don't know if anyone is familiar with like rodeo or rodeo culture. There's strong fashion influence around Pennington or Southwestern patterns that kind of come from that cowboy culture with the, with the indigenous influence along with like turquoise or even like fringe or leather work. Um, and I think it's, it's not, it's kind of just you, if you're sharing a similar experience, so if you're struggling, you're homesteading, like mm -hmm. you're doing it together, um, then you can relate and have those values. But I think when we're talking the very surface level and we're throwing these terms in here and we're throwing race and culture into here, then you're, um, you're not seeing when you have to perform a task together. So, mm -hmm. And I think that's why maybe um, those who might come from more povish areas, they relate because they know tactics to survive mm -hmm. together. So that's kind of how I see it, but I feel like we're not all in the same, you know, we, if we're all sitting together in a kitchen table, we're, we're not having the same conversation just yet. So hopefully we can work mm -hmm. more towards bringing that to light and explaining a little bit more. Right, mm -hmm. but 
but it would like we can get around that kitchen table. Our aunties would love your aunties, right? Like we'd be laughing together. Different, you know, it would be beautiful. But I think also part of that is like education. Like I need more education about mm. legacies of slavery mm. and how that intertwines with legacies of colonialism. Like mm. I need more awareness of that, and that's work I have to do. It was actually interesting. So. Um, Toronto Metropolitan used to be called Ryerson University after Egerton Ryerson, who is superintendent of education. And I was surprised, so he's call, often called the architect of the residential school system. I was surprised at, about his damage to black communities. And that's something I didn't know. So he had the power to let black students go to school and he, and he chose not to. And you know, he, he could have done it. And so that was almost more reason to take down the statue for me because it was his connection to residential schools is like kind of fuzzy, he's an architect, but it wasn't just him, but it was so clear how much damage he had to black students in Ontario. And that's, I was like, okay, that's just as much reason to tear down that statue. But so, I mean, it's an invitation. I mean, we'll, we'll, we know each other, we'll chat. It's gonna happen. We're but to all have those going together after this panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll, okay, aunties, auntie fashion, solidarity, getting together. <laughs> auntie summit. Oh my God. Well, probably time for one more question. Fantastic. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Riley. Nice to see you again. My name is Romana Mirza. I'm a PhD candidate in the Communication and Culture Program, like Riley is at Toronto Met. Um, and uh, the modest fashion uh, wave came just, I think, before the Indigenous fashion one. There was a lot of uh, pressure, same kind of issues coming at the modest fashion designers. Um, and so having, a, you know, a little experience working in that world with Muslim women who wear hijab, and now hearing what you have to say, I guess I'm just sharing a couple of open questions that we could all um, think about. And one thing that came to mind for me as you were talking, in my background, is I worked in the capitalist system for 30 years before I went back into academia late into life and started looking at the world with a much more critical eye and understanding why the things that happened to me in the capitalist world happened to me, because I started learning about all these you know, institutionalized systems of racism. So uh, while you were talking, what came to mind for me is that, you know, I'm beginning to see capitalism as a neo-colonizer, mm -hmm. really. And, and when Evan was talking about, you know, you both were talking about your experiences with the Met, and I worked with these large billion dollar corporations in marketing and branding and uh, all of that. How do we impose as, you know, marginalized groups our way of doing things? when invited to participate in those spaces? Um, do we have particular questions that we ask them to answer, mm -hmm. you know, so that they become qualified, you know, to work for us? Um, are there specific needs that we need to be met because we're living in our own spaces, in our, in our own land, so are there specific shipping requirements or insurance requirements that have to be met before we sign those partnership agreements? And I know that we're not in the position of power to ask for a lot, but maybe we need to be um, starting somewhere. And then just a, uh, addressing Dory's remark, which I thought you know, was um, so enlightening. I mean, I grew up in Toronto in the 70s and 80s. Um, I'm a 60s baby, <laughs> not a 90s baby. And uh, th there was so much in, you know, integrated, multicultural community. I, all my friends were from different ethnic backgrounds. And when we went home that night, we all got yelled at in different languages uh, by our mom. So I think the answer to this lack of um, sharing between communities is that we're all still learning how to shore up our own vulnerabilities yeah. within this larger system. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that we can do, be doing more of that together. And I'm so pleased, Dory, to be in the same room as you because Ben uh, Barry is my supervisor and he speaks so highly of you, so I look forward to meeting you. Oh, miigwech. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Any thoughts? No, I was like, yeah, right on. Yeah. <laughs> and period. Affirmative. Yeah. Um. More collaboration, more <laughs> conversations. Mm -hmm. But I know the common denominator of capitalism is a good point as well, right? Divide and yeah. conquer. I, I agree. Everyone, like, they need to go on their own journey of where, where they fall within that, where they fall within the responsibility um, hierarchy, you know, people who like I've like I've always felt like I I've been invited into spaces and I've been had access to spaces by virtue of the way that you know I the um, the the color of my skin, you know, it's it's just it's always been 
Um, like I said earlier, I, I could walk into a space and no one would know I was, I was indigenous until after the fact. And to see the difference of how I was treated from when I was first hired at a job to after, you know, you have to sit at lunch with your boss for a while and you get into the conversation of where you're from and how it instantly changes. You know, you, you need to kind of find your, I know that that's, that's a, a weird privilege to be able to go into these spaces and say things that other people might, might be, might be unsafe for them to do so, to speak in the way that I can and people will listen to me more because of the way I look. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult to stand in that power when you're, not, when you're someone who's very uncomfortable, um, even being on a stage talking like this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it is, it, you know, it, you, you need to find where you, where you fall in that, you know, scale of responsibility and um, that's all personal and it's all individual. But be, be be gentle with yourself as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's gonna take time. You can't right? be everyone and everything. You and you can't, can't you can't let like fear of starting stop you. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. It takes a great amount of courage to like face yourself and just um, make good with what you've been given and realize what power you have that can be used to, you know, better the greater community. Do you have one word to describe how you're feeling right now? Mm. My Anyone? stomach's growling. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go pee. Hungry? No, I was like, well, I was getting nervous. It's a bit hot. I have to go to the washroom. <laughs> very tired. Um, <laughs> like, I, um, I'm very, I'm feeling very humble. Meaning, mm. um, I just, and then thinking about the, uh, the question, thinking about. Um, how that related to uh, Evan and Karina explaining how they were necessarily treated, or uh, the Met could have asked them a little bit more questions mm -hmm. to make your experience um, more yeah, enjoyable. So uh, I, um, yeah, I'm just very happy to just be sitting alongside uh, you three and um, very uh, fortunate that we had just had a chance to sit and talk mm -hmm. and yeah. um, don't necessarily have to explain where these, you know, these sta our statements and responses are coming from that. Um, I think the more and more that we can have be more mouths right. to describe these feelings, but I, I'm, I'm feeling uh, very, uh, yeah, just very thankful in, in all aspects being part of, of this panel. So again, thank you. Mm -hmm. Evan? Yeah. Gratitude. Gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude. Grateful for all of these questions and for all these perspectives that have been brought up after our conversation and for the three of you and yeah. yeah. It's 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 so much nicer when there's more than it's not just one on one and right. you yeah know. totally yeah right. totally. I feel similarly I'm I'm tired mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm tired yeah um, but I do, I feel I don't know pensive I'm like oh there's so many right. things that came up today and right. I feel like we're all just kind of hanging out having a conversation so that's really awesome um, but yet there's so much more that we can do I think I'm looking forward to those. Mm -hmm. Things and you're so good at planning, <laughs> designing things, you know. So, um, but yeah, I'm so grateful too. And I just feel, I also feel, you know, listening to you talk, I feel a lot less alone because mm -hmm. I think our paths are very similar. Yeah. So that that's really um, makes me feel good. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, but anyway. All oh, great words. I'm re-energized, re-energized, mm -hmm. hopeful, thrilled, excited for these conversations to continue. And also have to go to the washroom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we give a round of applause to this panel? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, IFA yes. hashtag IFAF 2022. Uh, enjoy the festival. Check out that market. Have a good weekend. Yes. <laughs>